Uh, my name is Aidan Larkin. I'm the co-founder of Asset Reality. And uh, this is quite a strange experience having a microphone back on me. I used to be a, a auctioneer and sold proceeds of crime assets. So I'll try and not break into an auction spiel right now. The whole point of today's conversation is to talk about the sort of the, the crossover between crime and crypto assets. And really the theme is to try and keep people safe online. Um, I'm seeing lots of WhatsApp groups where I get uh, people asking me, what crypto should I invest in? Is this a good crypto asset? And then all of a sudden I get a, a text message a month later saying, so I've lost all my crypto and all my assets and my business has been ruined. How do I get it back? And again, it's a bit of a dark art as to how you actually get crypto assets back. And I know that I think yesterday, um, Johnny McCamley from CryptoClear went through a very good uh, a crypto talk. So I'm not here to talk about crypto assets in terms of what is Bitcoin, what is blockchain. I'm a huge advocate of keeping things simple. It's a complex asset, but Rolexes are complex, cars are complex, planes are complex. We don't need to understand the minutiae detail unless we're actually a developer or a tech person, you're in that space. So I'm gonna be talking about it at a quite a high level and around what, just to give you an awareness of if you're involved in crypto assets, or as you see in the news, more and more governments becoming involved, what happens when it goes wrong and why is it going wrong? And in my personal opinion, I'm a former criminal investigator for Revenue and Customs. I think it is the most traceable and best asset category in the world. And I think in about five years time, criminals will not use it once they realize just how easy it is for law enforcement to track and trace and do all of the wonderful things they can do. So that's my sort of North Star wish. But right now, there's lots of weaknesses in the system and it's being exploited. So a bit of a context about sort of me and um, sort of who I am. Um, Asset Reality um, is a tech stars company. We're a fintech startup. Again, I used to be a criminal investigator and I then was previously a proceeds of crime auctioneer. But obviously everyone's more interested in Ted, the miniature schnauzer, who I managed to get inside a, a little t-shirt for tech stars. So we've just started on this journey as a new tech startup. So you'll forgive me, I am not a tech person. I will do a horrible job of describing the intricacies of Bitcoin and blockchain. But I was the world's first seized Bitcoin auctioneer completely through no choice of my own. A government agency in Belgium and a government agency in the UK when I was working in Wilson's auction said, you have a contract to sell seized assets. You're selling this whether you like it or not. And we had to learn the hard way two years ago to the day uh, how to sell Bitcoin. So I've got practical experience. I'm also a UNODC consultant on crypto assets. I help government agencies sort of approach the challenges that the government regulators like FATF tell them what they should do. And my job is to try and realize, can we actually do that? Is that possible? And then we give training to different government agencies around the world. And I'm also a lecturer for the Anti-Corruption Academy in Vienna on seized assets and crypto assets. So just to give you a context, I don't sell crypto assets as in I'm not here to promote the next great sort of coin or start the next scam. Um, but I am a huge blockchain advocate. I do truly believe it is the next sort of version of our sort of our history. This will be the thing that is the reason that in a couple of years time, you'll not need six weeks to convey your property. It'll not take uh, our massive amounts of money to move lots of value around the world. Um, things like when I was in the auction business, fake watches, for example. I mean, the Louis Vuitton brands and some of the biggest conglomerates in the world now are investing a lot in blockchain technology to bring in, even using things like NFTs, to try and track what used to be counterfeit items or take a Rolex that's been seized and actually apply some sort of supply chain technology to be able to say, where did it come from? Where is it going in an immutable record? So there's loads of good reasons that, um, that I think blockchain and crypto assets will be here to stay. But let's get into the detail of what today is about. And today is about talking about if you are a victim of crypto crime, how do we keep people safe? And what is the tech industry doing around the world to try and address these problems? Because we've, we're all hearing the horror stories of what goes wrong um, when someone loses their assets. But I think it's worthwhile to take a step back and set some context to all of this. Asset recovery, which is when governments or anti-corruption investigations or insolvency practitioners basically try and take your assets back, is currently a big problem. Before crypto, some of the statistics worldwide are that only 1% of criminal proceeds are actually intercepted. So that's what we see in global proceeds of crime investigations. There's individual brilliant cases and individual brilliant results, but overall as a global system, we're not getting back all of the assets we possibly can. 
And I'm a huge advocate of trying to fix this problem because I also sit on the board of a charity, Sport Changes Life, a US and Irish charity that used to get funded through proceeds of crime money in Northern Ireland. We see this all around the world, good causes and wonderful initiatives that were funded by proceeds of crime. But despite the valiant efforts of officers and prosecutors, the whole system just isn't working fluidly. You get the best investigator in the world cannot force a court to sell a Lamborghini that's depreciating if the legislation doesn't allow them. So there's lots of reasons why around the world asset recovery is a challenge. So if you then put crypto assets on top of that, is that going to be the end of days? And how on earth are we going to take a wobbly system, put crypto on top of it and actually have results? And I think that crypto assets actually possess all of the answers and how governments are approaching cryptocurrency is the reason why it should be the safest asset category we'll ever deal with because we're seeing some of the best results in the world on crypto cases. One of the things I want to shout from the rooftops is I keep hearing people talking about crypto fraud, cryptocurrency crime. Crime is crime. If someone lock, locks you up and steals your assets, it's a robbery. It's not a Rolex robbery. It's aggravated burglary. If someone de deprives you of um, your life savings, it's a fraud case. It's not a dollar fraud case. It's not a sterling fraud case. But the media has done a big thing about talking about crypto crime and cryptocurrency crime. It's worth remembering that crypto isn't the bad thing. It's an asset category. It's like digital gold. But fraud is fraud. And we're seeing huge weaknesses in the system because people are not applying common sense. And like the people I talked about earlier on, I'm not joking when I say once a week, I get a WhatsApp message from someone saying, I was going to invest in this. It seems like a brilliant thing. And I put 10 grand into it. Like, do you know who the company is? No, well, they've got a nice website. Are they like regulated with the FCA? No. How are you going to get your money back if it goes wrong? I'll ring. There's no one to ring. With cryptocurrencies, there's no bank to call. There's no, the whole point of it is it's decentralized. So at least the whole takeaway from today is that if you go into this space, if you consider dealing with crypto assets, just go into it with your eyes wide open. But hopefully it's not going to be a, a negative tale of woe. I'm going to talk about some of the good things about crypto assets and, and crypto crime. Or the good results, not the, not the good things about crypto crime. Now, already I'm conscious that I'm ranting a little bit. And this is a very, very difficult topic to try and cover and try and discuss. And crypto asset recovery is quite a complex topic. So I'm going to keep it super high level. We've got 22 minutes left and we're not going to. But please, if any of you have a more advanced knowledge of cryptocurrency, crypto assets, please come and speak to me afterwards. I'm, more than, I'm, I'm around for a couple of hours before we have to go back to the airport. So I'm more than happy to answer any questions or chat about this further. So if we think about the first slide that talked about global asset recovery, getting money back in corruption investigations, getting money back from victims, you know, dismantling a drug dealer or the head of an organized crime and stripping them of their ill-gotten gains. Globally, that statistic isn't great. The UK alone last year, for all of the government agencies in the UK, recovered £208 million. Not to be sniffed at, a large amount of money. But put that in context, £208 million for one year for all of the government agencies in the UK. And about 20% of that pot goes to victims and good causes, roughly. In six months, the Met Police have nearly recovered £200 million in crypto assets alone. And this isn't a fluke. All around the world, government agencies who are now embracing technology solutions are actually realising that seizing crypto assets is literally shooting fish in a barrel. And one of the things we're trying to do at Asset Reality is promote this and let them know that there's really easy systems. It's not our technology. Other companies more clever than us do it. We're just trying to be the evangelist for the ecosystem to say, this is actually the easiest asset category you'll ever deal with. And if I'm working with my friends in Sport Changes Life, sitting on the board and we're trying to find money to pay for good causes, what I want to see is all of the law enforcement agencies joining this bandwagon and seizing more and more of these really easy assets, but they need the tools to do it. You couldn't imagine someone carrying out a DNA analysis if you know, Jim and Steve decide to give it a crack themselves with a magnifying glass at the desk. But that's what's happening in some agencies around the world where they're simply not using technology. How are you carrying out your blockchain tracing? Oh, we just we go online and use the, the blockchain explorer. 
that's like someone saying to you that I use Google to carry out my open source searches. So there's much more sophisticated tools available that aren't being exploited. And when they're exploited, the numbers are extraordinary. And if you're a victim of crypto crime, knowing that there's actually a really good chance that you're going to get a hell of a lot of money back is the reason we're trying to get this rallying cry to get more and more people talking about it. Because it should not be acceptable for a government agency anywhere in the world to have zero in their crypto asset recovery stats. But many of them do. And I heard one of the last speakers talking about we have COVID stats, but we don't have the same cancer stats. The same applies with proceeds of crime. We hear about lots of good news stories, but we don't have anybody asking the, the difficult questions. Where is the crypto asset recovery cases? What has HMRC as our tax authority recovered this year? I'm an ex-criminal tax inspector. It's my department. I don't want to badmouth my department, but you can Google it and see the stats. And there aren't any. That's our revenue authority of this country, and they haven't recovered crypto assets. And it's not to do with the investigators. The investigators are willing and ready to do it. They need access to the software and access to the tools en masse. Because when we see agencies deploying it, like the IRS in America, they seized a billion last November in Bitcoin. Anyone that follows crypto assets will know that that billion is now three and a half billion. So these seizures actually grow in value. There's no other category of asset that does that. Now, obviously, it can go down, it could drop. By the time we finish this bloody conference, it could be half a billion. But the fact is, it's there. As a victim of crime, you have a chance of actually getting something back. So when we look at the statistics, the IRS in America sort of highlighted this. And there was an interview done with Jared Koopman who talked about, you know, what is it actually like in terms of crypto assets? What are you seeing? We see all these big high-level figures, but what does it actually look like when we break it down for a victim of crime? So, and think this is enabled by the technology. $700,000 was seized in crypto assets in 2019. One year later, $137 million. Another year later, $1.2 billion. And now, with the price of crypto going up, that figure is nearly at $3 billion. The entire US economy, all of the law enforcement investigators and all of the asset sales in the US Marshals last year, 2.5 billion. So once again, crypto is eclipsing at a huge rate government or seizures around the world. It's not a UK blip, it's not a US blip, it's something we're seeing. So for me, it's a really positive message. As an ex-investigator, as someone who wants victims to get their money back, an asset reality, our job is that if you lose your crypto, we're the expert witness in court that tries to say, Ian lost crypto assets. We can see he's paid it into this account. We can see the fraudster has it sitting in a virtual currency exchange in Binance. We're going to get it back for you. And the thing to remember about crypto assets, it's all an open book. So if you know nothing about blockchain, just imagine if a fraud takes place and someone moves money from nationwide to HSBC, government agencies have to go through a myriad of data, info, data protection requests, legal requests to get the information from HSBC. And when they see nationwide, they then have to write a bunch of letters to nationwide. And the movement and the time those cases take is weeks, months, days. If it's offshore, it's not uncommon that it takes months. I've seen cases where it's taken a year to get information off two or three offshore jurisdictions. But if we think about crypto asset recovery, the blockchain ledger is open. Every single person here could download the blockchain ledger, the Bitcoin ledger onto their laptop today and look at every single transaction that has ever taken place. So when you apply tech companies to that equation, people who can carry out these analytics en masse, by a show of hands, who remembers the Twitter hack when Elon Musk and Obama all had their accounts hacked? Um, and they basically said, if you pay me one Bitcoin, I'll put a Bitcoin into your account. This was carried out by a 19-year-old kid in Bognor Regis in Wales and two mates he found online. Do you know how long it took to unravel their fraud and find their identities and have a, a PDF that could be presented in court? Less than 24 hours it took the analytic companies. And when one of them did it, it was all over LinkedIn and the other analytic companies were all comparing each other's notes because it's all open source. It's in the public domain. So the opportunities to, as a victim to actually get your money back, we don't have to think of asset recovery in the way of, I've lost a hundred pounds, I might get a couple of pounds back. If you lose a hundred pounds in crypto, you might get all of your money back. You might get your one Bitcoin back and it goes up in value. 
So there's really a positive message associated with the potential for crypto asset recovery. And we're seeing now, one of our sort of um, objectives today was to inform people as to what's actually happening in the world. The UK is taking the lead on civil and fraud and asset recovery around crypto assets. So CFAR is a group that has been set up. Uh, we're one of the founding members along with Grant Thornton and a few other uh, law firms across England and academics. And basically what we're trying to do is keep the UK court as the center of excellence for crypto matters. So that if someone's a victim of crypto crime, they know that they can come to the UK and they can take these actions because it's decentralized, one of the really interesting things that hasn't really been tested in court yet is, well, where is it based? Where is Bitcoin based? If it's decentralized, is it in the cloud? Is it my cloud in the UK? Or is it your cloud in British Virgin Islands? Or is it where the hackers sitting in Vietnam? But what has been established in court is that crypto is property. It's a regular asset. So it's not a fancy, weird, technical solution. If someone steals your crypto assets, you go after it just like they've stolen your Rolex or they've stolen your car. The courts have confirmed that. And more importantly, the courts have found that if you are based here, this is the court and this is the land that deals with the actual the, the, the dispute itself. So it should be quite comforting if you're getting involved in crypto to know that if something goes wrong, I have lots of precedents, there's lots of cases that have been dealt with already that show that as a victim in the UK, I can try and chase this down. And more importantly, I actually have a chance of getting my assets back. Now that is not, please, this is not legal advice. This is not to say, great, I'm gonna go and remortgage my house and buy Bitcoin because Aidan said it's fine. It can of course all go horribly wrong, but we actually have a really unique ability to actually recover assets now in ways never seen before. And some of the tech solutions that we're seeing in the market is from companies that didn't exist five years ago, companies that didn't exist four and, and six years ago. An example of this is companies like Chainalysis. Chainalysis are a blockchain analytic company. They are the types of companies that take all of this complex data that we see. When you're an investigator, and again, I'm picking on Ian, Ian loses his crypto assets. So we all know the blockchain is decentralized. So one of the first things we do is we type in Ian's address, the equivalent of his bank account number, and we see where the assets have been moved to. And by doing that, if we try and read that online, it's quite a complex thing to do. You're seeing all of these letters and numbers and jumbled up um, pieces of information that mean nothing to nobody. But technology solutions make it really simple to see from A to B where these assets are moving. And that's what we're seeing with companies like Chainalysis, TRM Labs, Elliptic, CypherTrace, lots of tech companies that didn't exist five years ago that are enabling government agencies to seize billions of dollars of crypto assets. So that's the sort of position we're in now. We have the ability now to trace and recover funds. When they're recovered, you have the ability then to store it. And then our job is as asset reality is to basically turn your money or turn your seized assets back into money and give it back to you as the victim. So I'm going to leave five minutes at the end to ask any, any questions anybody wants, but I have a few closing thoughts that I want to go through on this. One of the number one questions I constantly get is around this skepticism for Bitcoin and skepticism for crypto. The fact is, whether or not you believe in it, every time I tweet about Bitcoin, there's one particular author who wrote the book, Bitcoin, and he loves to jump on all my tweets and say it's the world's biggest scam. It's run by certain governments. One theory is, what if it's a scam meant to intentionally crash the dollar to shuffle in this new fiat currency? Regardless of what it is, it's an expensive asset category. None of us sit here today and question how Wi-Fi is constructed. It just works and we just use it. We don't all panic about it. There's always the conspiracy theorist and the sort of the tinfoil hat that's going to worry about what the secret meanings is. But the reality is it's just another asset category. If someone talks to you about crypto assets, there's about 10,000 different crypto assets. When you hear people promoting different crypto assets for you to buy and invest in, my recommendation would be treat it with the same skepticism that you treat everything. It is astonishing. Crypto-related fraud is up 24,000% in the last two and a half years. And the reason it's up, I'm sad to say, is because people are falling for it. And they're not, we're not being skeptical or cynical enough. 
if I turned up at any one of your doorsteps today or even after this talk and said to you, I have a great idea of a new company. I want you to give me £10,000. You don't know who I am, but I promise you it's a sure thing. You'd laugh me out of the room. Yet people are investing in cryptocurrencies in record amounts with a company they've never heard of, not knowing who the individuals are behind the company, knowing the company isn't regulated, and the, the cheat line you can take away from all of this, none of them are regulated. There's like 10 companies in all of the UK currently registered with the FCA. Go onto the FCA website, there's a crypto register, you can see the 10, and none of them are the types of companies you'll be hearing about in these investments day in, day out. So I treat them all with a healthy dose of skepticism, and usually our mate on the right here, most people that try and promote a crypto to you is because they have 25 million of them that they bought for 10p and they're trying to get all of their mates to bid or to buy it as well because then that drives the price up. Because all of the crypto activity, just think of it as stocks and shares. If I invest in my mate's company and we have 20 million shares, if I start spending a bit of money and I get all my mates to spend money, it's a pyramid scheme. As my mates start to put money in, the value of my stock goes up I pull mines out. But people are clever, and what they know is is that all of the algorithms on trading websites, if they see lots of people putting money in, they think you know something we don't, and then innocent people start buying the crypto assets, and it's called a rug pull, and then the people who originally formed the asset cash out, and you have no chance of getting these assets back. So my point is, if you're gonna invest in crypto assets, stick to the main ones that you know, unless you do your research, Virtually every crypto asset that exists has a white paper, has a research group behind it. If you pick something like VE Chain, you can go on to CoinMarketCap. You can see that they have contracts with BMW and Grant Thornton. They're working with Walmart and certain companies. Do your research into them in exactly the same way you would research. We're in an ecosystem of startups. I am a co-founder of a startup. I get asked lots of questions about my business. I expect people to ask me lots of questions about my business if I'm asking them for investment. So treat crypto assets with the same skepticism. Look at it, look who is behind it, but also take comfort that you shouldn't just run away from crypto assets altogether because the actual asset recovery infrastructure is so strong and so robust that actually the chances that if it goes horribly wrong that you might get some money back is actually quite positive. So we're hoping that what we'll see is further rollout. You will see in the next couple of weeks, we're at a launch event with Standard Charter. Standard Charter will be one of the first sort of high street names. Obviously they're covering, they have that awful Liverpool sponsorship. Um, that's how most people know Standard Charter. So they're one of the first ones. They've got a company called Zodia. They're launching digital asset and custodian services. So it means if you have Bitcoin, you can go to someone like that to store your assets. Because one of the biggest problems we see and again, I don't mean to be harsh, but sometimes it's just a lack of common sense. I know people who were programmers five years ago who have a Bitcoin small fortune, hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of Bitcoin sitting on a USB stick like this, and it's under the bed. And you're thinking, if it was diamonds, would you keep it under the bed? If it was gold bars, would you keep it under the bed? Well, no, I'd be worried someone would rob me. We're seeing cases, the Terezco case, it's in the public domain. Feel free to Google it. Terezco was a guy, an um, organized criminal in Surrey. I auctioned all of his assets. Terezco was taken away, tiger kidnapped and beaten up for his crypto assets. The reason the police knew about him is because he phoned his girlfriend, phoned and reported him missing because another criminal gang tied him up in the boot of a car and were trying to beat the private key out of him because they wanted access to his crypto assets. So again, treat it like any other asset category put it in an insured custodian account. There are lots of them that exist around the world. Fidelity, one of the biggest asset managers in the world now, offer Fidelity digital assets. So if you're going to be in crypto assets, there are digital insured solutions to store it. If you lose crypto assets, there are ways to recover it and try and get your crypto assets back. And also the UK now has established itself as a pretty much a center of excellence in terms of asset recovery in crypto cases. So I hopefully sort of end that on a positive note, that it's not all doom and gloom. I'm not here to say, don't use crypto assets or run away from them. But please, I don't ever want to see any of you as a client. I, the only clients I get are tales of woe. I used to be a tax inspector, now I'm doing this job. I think my dad said I just need to be an undertaker and I've pretty much covered all essential industries. I sort of, uh, I get paid on people's devastation, sorry. But it happens and we see it all the time. So 
If anyone has any questions, you can either email through, stop me at the end, or if you're brave enough to speak in front of the crowd, please just shout out and I'll happily take any questions. But I thank you for your time and for listening. Thank you.